Hey everyone, Dave here. Welcome to the new episode. Today I'll be talking about the Commodore 1541 disk drive. Specifically, I had somebody ask me a question in a YouTube comment, which is basically, this thing has a CPU in it, can it be used as a standalone computer? So that's what we're going to be talking about, and I think you're going to love it. I'll start by explaining what it means that the 1541 disk drive had its own CPU. If you open up your 1541 disk drive, you'll see it. Right there, there's an MOS6502 CPU on the board. In addition, it has its own RAM. It has two 6522 VIA, or Versatile Interface Adapter chips. They're used to control the drive motors and handle serial communication with the host computer. And these two ROM chips, they contain all the code to make this work. So it basically has all the stuff a general purpose computer needs. Let's compare the 1541 with a computer. The 1541 would be a low-end computer at best, so I'll compare it against a fairly low-end Commodore machine from the day, the VIC-20. If you open your VIC-20 case and remove the board, this is what greets you. And the bones are pretty much the same as the 1541. There's a 6502 CPU, some RAM, two 6522 VIA chips, and some ROM for kernel, basic, and the character set. That's exactly what we just saw in the 1541. The fundamental building blocks of the Commodore 1541 disk drive and the Commodore VIC-20 computer are identical. We know they share a similar foundation, so let's talk about how they differ. Back to looking at the VIC-20 PCB. Now we're going to find various glue logic and address decoding chips on here. They may not be exact between the VIC-20 and the 1541, but no big deal. The big deal though is the 6560 VIC chip. The VIC-20 has a video chip built in that gives it color graphics and sound. The VIC chip is still only scratching the surface here, so I'll keep going. Taking an overall look at the VIC-20, it has a full typewriter style keyboard for an input device. It has a joystick port, another input device. Uh, there's a cartridge port, most commonly used for game cartridges, uh, video output connector, serial connector for peripherals like printers and disk drives, tape drive interface, and finally, a user port. If you add all this up, the VIC-20 can be described as a general purpose computing device. So how does the 1541 disk drive compare? Well, it can use five and a quarter inch floppy disks as input or output, and there are two serial connectors on the back. So while the 1541 and VIC-20 are built on the same foundation, that's where the similarities end when comparing them as computing devices. The VIC-20 is a general purpose computing device, while the 1541 is a purpose built computing device that's really only useful as a disk drive, or is it? Let's lower expectations a little bit and take a look at Commodore's very first computer, the Kim-1 single board computer. KIM stood for Keyboard Input Monitor, and the one indicated that it had 1K of RAM, just like the 64 and C64 indicated it had 64K. Technically, these were developed by MOS Technology Inc. just before Commodore purchased the company, but Commodore sold these as Commodore branded computers beginning in 1976. Now, just like I described how the 1541 and VIC-20 shared the same basic building blocks, the Kim-1 does as well. It has a 6502 CPU, RAM, and two 6530R Riot chips, which stood for RAM, ROM, Input, Output, Timer. And they're functionally very similar to the 6522 VIA chips in the 1541 and VIC-20, but they have some RAM and ROM in them as well. I'd still classify these as general purpose computing devices, but they're much closer in functionality to a 1541 disk drive than the VIC-20 is. The Kim-1 doesn't have a video chip. It has a keyboard, but it's a tiny calculator keyboard that only contains enough keys to input 6502 machine language. And the display output is just six LEDs. But even if we lower our expectations, the Kim-1 has a keypad and LED display the 1541 doesn't have. Now sure, I could make hardware modifications to the 1541 and wire up additional PCBs to support a keyboard or a video output or any number of other capabilities, but at some point, that would make it no longer a 1541 disk drive. So for this video, I'd like to show that a 1541 can be used as a general purpose computing device without making any hardware modifications to it. I want to be able to use exactly what the 1541 provides. So let's go back to the Kim-1 for a moment. I mentioned it uses that little keypad for input and six LEDs for output, but remember that the Kim-1 was designed in the mid-1970s, so it also has the ability to interface with a teletype device. 
In the early days of computing, teletype or teleprinter devices were connected to large mainframe computers over a serial connection. You could type commands over the serial connection to the computer and it would send output back over the serial connection which would be printed on paper. As technology evolved, terminals were invented. Uh, probably the most well-known example is the DEC VT100. The concept was still the same though. It was still a serial connection to a host computer, but instead of printing the computer's output to paper, it could be displayed on a screen. And we still use terminal emulators today. And if you're younger and didn't grow up through the evolution of this technology, you probably never gave it much thought why they're called terminal emulators. It's because they're software that emulates a physical terminal. Even on Linux today, we use the term TTY to describe terminal devices. And TTY is derived from teletype. I'll do a super quick demonstration of communicating with the Kim One single board computer over its TTY interface so you can see what that looks like. Once it connects, my terminal is displaying the 16-bit address I'm looking at and the 8-bit value at that address on the Kim One. So, four hex digits and two hex digits. When you're not in TTY mode, this is what's displayed on the native LED display. In case you're not familiar with a Kim One, I want to show you the Hello World experience on a VIC-20 because this is what you're probably used to seeing if you're into 8-bit computers. built-in basic editor, about 10 seconds of effort, and you're done. It doesn't get a whole lot easier than that, right? Now the Kim One, on the other hand, is probably just a smidge more involved. There isn't a native basic interpreter on the Kim One. There's not even an assembler. You program in straight 6502 machine language, entering one 8-bit value at a time. On the right is my Hello World program in 6502 assembly language, and on the left is the hand-assembled 6502 machine language that I have to enter one byte at a time into the Kim One. And then once we're all done entering it, we go to address 0200, press G, and it executes, hello world. What I want you to take from this demonstration is that the only thing I'm running on the MacBook is a terminal emulator. I'm using that to directly interface with the Kim One over its serial interface, so all the output was generated by the Kim One and the hello world program executed on the Kim One. So you see what the plan is now. I want to run the Kim One's kernel on a 1541 disk drive thereby turning the 1541 disk drive into a general purpose computing device. Uh, now, I said before I don't want to make any hardware modifications to the 1541, and I don't, but the very least I have to do is to replace the ROM in it. If I leave the factory Commodore ROMs in there, it is and will always be a disk drive. So I'll pop the ROM out, I will burn a custom EEPROM with a modified version of the Kim One kernel, I'll insert that, and we should be able to boot the 1541 as a Kim One, and we'll talk to it using serial terminal communications over the pins on the IEC bus in the back. Brilliant. Now let's see if it'll actually work. I said we'll use the existing serial ports on the 1541 and do serial TTY communication over those. So let's look at a 1541 schematic diagram to see how this will work. As we learned earlier, the 1541 has two MOS6522 VIA chips in it. UC2 up here handles controlling the disk drive mechanism. So starting and stopping the spindle motor, positioning the stepper motor, etc. None of the pins on the UC2 VIA are exposed at the two serial connectors on the back of the drive, so we won't be using this VIA. UC3 down here is what handles serial communication with the host computer over the serial bus. So pins on this VIA are exposed at the serial connectors on the back of the drive. I'll isolate this VIA and the pins connected to the bus. P2 and P3 down here are the serial connectors. They're not two serial buses. Rather, there are two connectors to one bus. It's so you can daisy chain serial devices. That means there are only six pins to work with. Except, remember that I'm not going to change any hardware on the 1541. That means not rewiring where any of the pins are connected. Pin 6 is hardwired to the reset pin on the 6522. I can't use that to transmit serial data. Pin 2 goes to ground also can't transmit serial data over that. Pin 1 is the service request, and that goes to nothing. Uh, 3 is hardwired to attention, so that leaves me with pins 4 and 5. P2 
pin 4 is connected to VIA pins 12 and 13, and in Commodore serial disk I.O. protocol, they're used as clock input and output pins. Pin 5 is connected to VIA pins 10 and 11, and in Commodore's protocol, they're used as data input and output pins. To implement a serial TTY connection, I need at minimum two wires, transmit and receive. So I can use pin 5 as the transmit pin, and pin 4 as the receive pin. You might assume that since these pins are already used as serial disk I.O. pins, there's some magic happening and serial TTY will quote, just work. Commodore Serial Disk Protocol is a proprietary implementation that bears no resemblance at all to Serial Teletype Protocol. I did a couple previous videos that dig into Commodore's bus protocol, so check those out. Another issue I have to overcome is that the pins on Commodore's Serial Connector all operate electrically at TTL levels, which are not compatible with RS-232 levels. This is not a new problem, and it's fortunately very simple to overcome. The MAX-232 chip, or the newer MAX-3232 chip, handles converting RS-232 voltages to TTL voltages. I purchased these little pre-built boards off Amazon which have the DB9 connector, the MAX3232 chip, and all the passives already soldered on the board for you. You just have to connect your TTL transmit and receive lines. Super simple. All right, we have a cable now. Standard Commodore IEC serial connector on this end. Uh, I soldered the pins two, four, and five, which are gonna be two for ground, four and five for transmit and receive. We have the fancy little Max 3232 board here. Um, the transmit and receive and ground from here are connected to transmit, receive, and ground here. Then I needed a power cable, so I just lopped the end off of an old USB cable I had laying around, and I soldered power and ground from that. So that's what will power this chip. Next thing I have plugged in here is an RS-232 to USB converter, so that I can connect USB to my MacBook and then do TTY serial from a Commodore IEC port to a USB port on my MacBook. Magic! The last thing I need is the code to make this all work. The entire Kim1 kernel was published in the original MOS Technology User Manual. I went to Vern Grainer's Kim-1.com because he has the user manual available in text format. I started with a copy and paste of this code and modified it to work on the 1541, so there was very little code to write from scratch. Minor bits to initialize the 1541 hardware, because remember, I'm completely removing the stock 1541 ROMs, so I have to handle things like setting up the stack on my own. And then I had to modify the Kim 1's I.O. routines, get CH and out CH, to implement serial teletype protocol over the 1541's native serial bus lines. With the code assembled, I can burn it to a 2764 EEPROM. Okay, we have an EEPROM now, so I need to open up the 1541, remove the factory Commodore ROMs from that, and insert the new EEPROM that has the modified Kim-1 kernel.
All right, the two ROM chips we need to remove, these guys right up here. 901229 and 325302. So the ROM I removed, it's a 2364 mask ROM. The EEPROM I'm replacing it with is a 2764 EEPROM. And you can probably see really quickly that we've got a little issue there. The EEPROM is 28 pin, the mask ROM is 24 pin. Now there are solutions for this. One is to do your own homemade job like I did here and make a, a socket sandwich and wire up some bodge wires. You can actually buy these online, I think like PCB way. If you just, if you just look for 2364 to 2764 adapter, you'll find many. This is homemade and it's ugly, but it's all I had, so I'm using this. So basically you put your EEPROM in there, you plug this in. We're gonna be using the E000 slot and leaving the C0000, however many zero slot, empty. I hooked up the 1541 disk drive using my fancy homemade cable, and it's powered on. Now let's see if I can connect using Minicom. There it is! The Kim prompt just as expected, running on a bone stock Commodore 1541 disk drive. Let me get Hello World going just to prove that it works here, just like it did on a real Kim 1. The Kim 1 and 1541 both have RAM mapped at hex 0200, so I'm starting Hello World at the same location as I did on the Kim 1. Notice that the out CH routine is not at the same address as it was in the Kim 1. I'm running the Kim 1 kernel at hex E000, so out CH is at hex E11C on the 1541. Ready to run it here. You're looking at a Hello World program running on a Commodore 1541 disk drive. You can't imagine how happy I was when I got this working. I mean, it's pretty neat, right? I think we can safely say that, yeah, a Commodore 1541 disk drive can run as a standalone computer. It's nowhere near as simple as the VIC-20 was, but maybe there's something I can do about that, too. There was a dialect of BASIC written called Tiny Basic, and it would run on the Kim 1. Well, we have this empty ROM slot here at C000, so I went ahead and I ported Tiny Basic to run on the 1541. I burned it to a 2764 EEPROM, so let's check that out. That socket's mapped in at C000. So go there, execute. That colon is the tiny basic prompt, and I'll do a print hello. Actually, I should have done a line number, so I'll go back in 10 print. And that didn't work. I don't think backspace worked properly over the terminal. That's okay, let me try that again for you. I don't know that you can get a whole lot more awesome than this. We sort of replicated the VIC-20 experience running on a 1541 disk drive. Now, I'm not kidding myself here. This is not as capable as a Kim-1 even, let alone a VIC-20. The Kim-1 has an application connector and an expansion connector that this doesn't have. We are really captive to be able to basically write Hello World or anything simple that just uses the CPU. We can't really interact with the outside world in any way, shape, or form other than through the serial terminal. That's all we get. But still, it was a pretty neat exercise and I'm glad somebody asked that question. Now, if you enjoyed this content, I hope you'll take the time to like, maybe even subscribe, tell your friends and family. Until I see you next time, have a great one.